Board games don't occur in a vacuum. They happen at a specific time with specific people. Each experience is more than a set of rules. We want to highlight and capture these experiences, even when it's just our family during COVID. We are playing games we enjoy, trying to avoid the hotness. But sometimes I can't help myself. And trying to play what's already on our shelves. I'm Andrew. And I'm Pia. And this is what we got to the table. Hi, I'm Andrew. And I'm Pia. We've been in the hobby for eight years, playing board games. We got started playing Ticket to Ride for the first time, borrowed it from a game store next to our house. We brought the board game to some outside seating um, in front of a grocery store and we played Ticket to Ride and it was really fun. Yeah, I, it was definitely a moment where I was like, oh, maybe modern board games are different than I originally thought or I had kind of not given them their due. Um, I was always kind of interested in kind of the dungy board game stores at, of the time uh, that, uh, that I would go into and I was like, oh, this stuff seems fun, but I don't feel like I have the time uh, or the money to, to dive in or, or the people really at the time. So uh, that was the first time I was like, oh, these aren't as hard as I thought it was. And I didn't play any board games growing up. Andrew got into the hobby and then I started getting into it. Each week we're gonna be discussing both the games that we played and how we got them to the table kind of in the context of uh, each week. And that's how it's uh, different than just a podcast or a review. These are just impressions. We're, we're giving you our impressions of each play. So from play to play, we may start loving a game and then eventually be over it. This week we played Lavinia, uh, Herbaceous. We played Fort by Letter Games and uh, Eric Lang's Cthulhu Death May Die. <laughs> So we'll start with the card games and we'll end with the big box, Cthulhu Death May Die. Uh, what did you think of Lavinia? It was fun. It was like Parks with a little bit more to it. I really enjoyed it. I We actually got to play it while I was nursing our baby. I would just tell Andrew to move my pieces and it was a really fun game that we fit in. I think card games i used to have a bias against them because i felt like if you're gonna play a board game you should play something big and hefty with miniatures or a really big board like cthulhu death may die which i also liked but i'm starting to really like how card games fit into our life i think i might have struggled with the rules initially but it's similar to parks so i had understood the mechanic of the first player going forward and then the next player that goes is whoever's the furthest behind. Board games is like a language so if you learn one mechanic from one board game it helps with learning other ones. Yeah. In Lavinia you are grape pickers uh, slowly moving your way through the vineyards I don't know stealing people's grapes and then at the end you deliver them to the uh, wineries, in which case you score points from that. It The gameplay is very similar to Parks. Yeah it's that Whoever's, it's it's a row, and whoever's in the last place uh, is the one who moves forward. And you can move as far forward, you can move all the way to the end if you'd like. You're gathering whatever spot you land on. So in this, there's cards with different types of grapes, and you're collecting those, so there's some hand management. Um, there's a little bit more to it, I think, than Parks. Um, it was just surprising because it comes in a smaller box. A little bit bigger setup time than Parks. Parks is is, is a, just a really amazing game and production. Yeah, I'd suggest going there first if, if, if you're going to get a game like this, but this is a great next step. It's a little less mean than Parks. In Parks, you can really block people from getting what they want. You can If you can play your whole game just watching other players and blocking them from, you know, if they need a sun tile or something. In this, uh, there's two spots on each location, and so generally speaking, it's harder to fully block another player out. So it's a little bit nicer. Uh, in You're drinking way. wine and <laughs> sharing spaces. Yeah, but the but another fun part is that you have to fill your you have two baskets and you're filling them, and so a little bit of the puzzle is which grapes go into which baskets because they each have to do a different order, and if you plan incorrectly, you can end up with ugly basket of grapes. <laughs> but yeah, it's really, it plays really quick. You played while you were nursing. That was really, really cool. And it was a satisfying little card game. Um, Lavinia. Lavinia. 
<laughs> an obvious pairing of Lavinia is wine. <laughs> and an obvious pairing for Herbaceous is a biscuit. <laughs> because there's a card with a biscuit on it. <laughs> Herbaceous is a Stephen Finn game. He's one of the few doctors that make games. Uh, we talked about Dr. Knizia last week, and uh, this week we're talking about Dr. Stephen Finn. Um, I may be wrong about this, but I think he's a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew's giving out PhDs to people. <laughs> if I'm wrong, then Board Game Barrage is wrong, or I listened to them incorrectly. <laughs> <laughs> so in Herbaceous, you gather sets. So you pull a card and you decide to put it in your personal garden or in the public community garden. Herbaceous is a game about passive aggressive gardening where you take a card, which is some sort of herb, and you're either placing it in your personal garden or you're placing it in this public garden, in which case we can all grab from. I always like imagining these old little ladies or old little men going to the community garden and just snatching up all the all the community herbs so that the other people can't take them <laughs> and make the things that they want to make with them. It is a very pleasant game. It's not very mean, but there's a lot of passive aggressive moves where you're like, oh, I need this, but I know you also need it, so I'm going to grab it right now. And it's very much a push your luck thing because this community garden keeps growing and growing and you've got orders that you want to fulfill and you're putting your thing, it's like a set collection thing where you're collecting certain sets of, you know, rosemary or lavender, um, and you're putting them in jars in different sets. And so you're collecting sets of either all the same herb, like five lavender, pairs of herbs, like two lavender, two basil, two rosemary, and you score points. That's how you play. You, have, you're, you want them to grow in the middle so you get the best set, but everyone else is doing that too, and so someone might grab the cards before you. For as chill as it is, because you're just playing a card and you put it in one of the two places, and it's quick decisions. Herbaceous, it was really easy to learn. I think I learned it in just a few minutes, and we started playing it in the afternoon. And then of course, you know, we're new parents, so that was interrupted. It took us the whole day to play, play our first game. And then the next day we, we got to the table right when the baby went to sleep and we were able to play three whole games in just that amount of time, which, which felt like a treat because uh, once you get past that first game, the strategies start you know opening up in your mind. And it's the first time I think I didn't quite get it till about halfway through the game. And then, then I started seeing how passive aggressive that community garden can be and all the all the people going in there and stealing your stuff which is funny because <laughs> <laughs> i like very take that type of move so a passive aggressive game of gardening is really funny mm -hmm. to me but i also like the game because as new parents and because of the state of the world and stress i'm very into games with low rules overhead and then more strategy the bonus part is that it's beautiful so you get to play with art and that's why i liked herbaceous yeah speaking of playing with art we also played a game called fort by letter games it's just very cute and very fun and playful and it, spunky yeah there's just all these little kids with the same artist who did Root, different game designer, but it's a deck building game. So if you're not familiar with that, it means 
the everyone starts with the same cards and throughout the game you add cards to your deck and generally speaking you play through your hand every turn and you're just going through your deck over and over again trying to make it better you're trying to get cards out that are bad and good cards in and what makes fort different is that you actually only play one card per turn it took me a while like i was reading the i had to like read that like five times in the because you play one card and then you follow it with suits like in a typical standard card game. So there's all these suits in the game, which are like fun things like glue and scissors, and they're just like fun kid toys. So the, the glue suit, all the kids are like crafty kids. There's like a squiggly cheeks, I think was one of the kids that I was playing, that I kept playing, and he would always get me a bunch of points. So I was trying to play him. He would get me points for things in my backpack, but. It's a game where the theme comes through very well. You're a bunch of kids playing a fort, and the funniest part is every card that you don't play on your turn goes into your yard because you didn't play with, the, with those kids, and then the other players can take them. And so your your deck is always getting stolen from by other players. It's probably the only deck building game where I was consistently just, I had like six cards in my whole deck for a little while because they kept getting stolen. Yeah, what did you think of fort? <laughs> I really enjoyed it after I was able to understand the play on the deck building mechanic, which was throwing my brain off as well. Our cognitive flexibility was low when we were learning this game, but once we figured it out, it was very fun to read the cards and imagine inviting this kid to play and then kicking out the other kids or something very nostalgic, whimsical, playful and light. Like the levity of it, I feel like, was very, for lack of a better word, fun. <laughs> In some ways, immersive because there's sets of kids that are brainy kids and their suits are books. And there's sets of kids that are like outdoorsy kids and they're playing with the dirt and they're Boy Scouts. It's just I think the theme was really fun and exciting to kind of pull another card and see what that kid and the art look like. Yeah, one thing I really appreciated about the theme is it's very inviting or original for, for a card game. I think it definitely does a good job of expanding the potential audience. Just like Root expanded the potential audience for kind of hardcore war games, Fort expands the potential audience for deck building games as much as Dominion was one of the first games that got me into the hobby. I think the thing that always threw me off about Dominion was the theme was, it's almost, it's barely there. You just kind of make up inside jokes about the names of the cards and- Throne uh, room! Yeah. What does that mean? <laughs> just throne rooming all the different cards and doubling them up. Uh, but for, I feel like it has such, it, for a deck building game, I've never seen a deck building game do a theme this well, which was really exciting to see uh, exist in the hobby. And it's small, it's, it's cheap. I could recommend this to a lot of different people. It is a little bit more complex than Dominion, so it would be, you know, a little bit to wrap your head around if you're brand new to the hobby, but I think it's, it's a very inviting game. And then also we, um, which I think leads into the conversation where we were, watching the 24-hour stream of Tabletop Network, which was so much fun. We clued into one particular stream with Paul Dean and Board Game Blitz, and they started talking about uh, gatekeeping in the hobby, and... We were so excited about it, because that conversation is very interesting and important to us. Yeah, and uh, we wish they could have dig dug in even deeper, but it was kind of on a timeline, so they, they ended up moving on, but... Uh, Paul Dean was talking about maybe more casual gamers and women in particular who, who ha are very proficient gamers but will say something along the lines of, oh, I've just played these games. I'm not like... I'm not a board gamer. Yeah. But really, they are. And Paul Dean was saying, no, with everything you've said about specifically Board Game Blitz was talking about role-playing games. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, if you've played those games, sounds like you're a gamer, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot about how, for a while, I thought this was your hobby. It's just, you know, your games are in our apartment, so they're sort of my hobby, too. Because we're socially distancing, 
we aren't able to play as many games as we would like to, but consequently, I've been watching a lot of YouTube videos and podcasts like Board Game Barrage, which has a female podcaster in it as well. And it just makes me excited when I see women represented in the board game space, which makes me more excited to play games, which is great for both of us because it's a lot of fun to play games. Speaking of having fun while playing games, <laughs> we also played Cthulhu Death May Die by Eric Ling and Rob Davio. Cthulhu Death May Die is a cooperative game. It's a big box game with giant miniatures of Cthulhu and all his little buddies and they're trying to take over the world. <laughs> but in this version, you are just playing the final act of the story. So there's no, there's not a lot of mystery. You're just kicking down the door. You're a couple of crazy people who want to go kill a big monster. It's like a cutscene where you just, the game starts where it's like everything has happened, escalated in the story and then cut. This game starts. <laughs> yeah, it starts, you literally at the front door of the mansion, you kick down the door, you got big guns in your hands, and you start killing cultists and monsters. Um, it was very, very fun. Uh, it was definitely one that if you've played this type of game, so Mansions of Madness is another game like this, or uh, probably the first game we played that was like this was uh, Betrayal on House on the Hill. And, um, any of these games, they, they share a lot of DNA in terms of you're walking around a house, you're sometimes adding tiles to the house, this one you're not, and then you're rolling dice to do kind of role-playing game style checks, and then fighting monsters. And so this one shares a lot in common with those type of games. It was pretty easy for me to learn just because, like we said, board gaming is a language, rules are a language. Once you learn one mechanic, it just you see it in another game and it's easy to pick up on. So this has, uh, was easy to learn if you've played this type of game. If it's your first one, it's not a bad starting point. It's got some pretty interesting things going on in it. We, like every time we play a game for the first time, got a few things incorrect, which made it a little easier on us, but we still barely beat it. So there was one moment in the game that was particularly surprising. Partway through the game, Cthulhu appears because they've completed the ritual. And he shows up, Pia, pulls out her shotgun, shoots him in the head, and one-shots him. He's down. And we're like, oh, great, that, that was really easy. And then I double-checked the rules, and it said, move to stage two. And then I checked, and there's four stages to the boss. <laughs> so it was just the beginning of the fight, which was uh, a big surprise, but a really cool mechanic, because I feel like the way they make bosses in games oftentimes harder. It's just giving them more health, but having the, the you know, finishing each stage and each stage has a full health uh, was, was a really cool way to make the boss feel really epic and then it evolves as you're fighting it as well. This week I was itching for a game that was more thematic and cinematic. Mm -hmm. And so Andrew picked this game because we have really enjoyed HBO's Lovecraft Country, and it delivered. This game is probably the closest thing to a board game version of Lovecraft Country. It's one thing that's interesting. Lovecraft is such a problematic uh, person, um, and he interweaved a lot of racism in his themes. And so it's, it's really cool to see uh, people of color and black artists kind of reclaim that setting. The thing that's the coolest part about the setting to me is he, he made it open source before the internet and stuff. So he, he invited people to write stories in his setting. But in his mind, it was just going to be white males writing in his setting. But fast forward 100 years and you have people of all, all backgrounds taking and claiming these stories. And uh, if you haven't seen Lovecraft Country, it's a brilliant, brilliant TV show. This the one, best show, the best show in like of 2020, I think. Mm -hmm. Eric Lang, uh, who is a black board game designer, um, being a part of this, you could see, I don't know whose idea it was, but all the cultists just look like KKK members, <laughs> and they're uh, they're the the goons that you're murdering in this. It grounds a very bizarre world into a well, cultists and KKK, they visually 
makes sense to just be the same character. Mm -hmm. So Cthulhu Death May Die, it's, it's definitely like a popcorn flick of a board game, lots of action, and the coolest part about it that I enjoyed was that as you go more insane, you become more powerful. You get, every time you level up is when you get to a certain level of insanity, which I thought was a, was a cool twist. Um, well, because fighting all these monsters takes a toll on you, mm -hmm. but maybe the story is that you also get more resilient and you have more fortitude to keep fighting them. Mm -hmm. And there's the tension of stay sane, but also there's wear and tear to your brain. So those are the four games that we are going over this week. We, this is the final section where we each get to pick our favorite game of the week. It's hard because I think that games, it's more about mood sometimes. Because there is a time that I'll definitely be in the mood for more Cthulhu Death May Die. I'm really excited to play these three yeah, I was going to uh, say, I didn't really follow the rules. I said all four. Yeah. <laughs> so, Pia's favorite is all the games. My favorite, I think, was Herbaceous. I think it was just so satisfying to get three games in one hour and really kind of get to that next level of strategy where uh, so many times we play a game once, twice, and then move on to the next one. And it's just fun to kind of sit with the same game a few times, so... Herbaceous is really easy to do that with. That's true because we're very, we're easily distracted as gamers. We'll play a game once or twice, maybe, mm -hmm. and then we're on to the next hotness. Mm -hmm. These are the games that we got to the table this week. What did you play? Thanks for joining us and see you next week. Board Games Plus Life. <laughs>